Good evening, and welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savitri, with our brother Alok. We are in the book of the Traveler of the Worlds, Canto 11, Kingdoms and Godheads of the Greater Mind, page 266, and we begin with Archmasons of the Eternal Thaumaturge. So, you know, uh, this word Archmason, and we, we uh, in, in Indian mythology, it's there in Greek mythology also. Hephaestus, the god who built the worlds. Yes. So in Indian mythology, you have Vishwakarma. Now, you know, now in, in, the, in the drive towards monism, we have lost contact with these various uh, architects and builders, which has been in, not a very uh, good development because it doesn't explain creation. So there is a big hiatus between the creator and the creation because there is the one and there is right here the struggling world. But uh, if you really want to understand creation and have an impact on it, we have to understand all these forces. This knowledge was there in ancient times. You have um, the Greek mythology, you have Egyptian mythology to an extent. Yes. And of course the Indian mythology where it's described in great detail. Even there is a puja, Vishwakarma puja in India. It's kept alive through a living tradition wherein you pray, worship the builder of the worlds. There are marvelous stories. So now you can see where, where he is placed, Archmason. And whenever even on earth something has to be made, and there is a very in fact symbolic story, for example, Dwarka, and uh, the dwelling place for Shiva, there is a palace on Kailash. So all these are built by this Archmason. And now we will understand what it means here. He is the primary one. Of the eternal thaumaturge. Yes. The eternal magician. Yes. Magician. Who, because he is free. There are no rules and laws. So you have to, uh, to really create that, uh, you know, process. You have to make a process. Yes. And that's where the whole problem comes. Because in trying to make a process out of the free infinite, um, you limit in certain ways. And that's what we will see running throughout as a common theme. Molders and measurers of fragmented space. They have made their plan of the concealed and known. A dwelling house for the invisible king. It's a very early writing of Sri in before coming to Pondicherry. It's a very interesting piece of writing where it is titled, it is God the Invisible King. And, the, and space and time are nothing but, you know, for his, like his dwelling place. And naturally, whatever dwelling place you may build, it will always fall short because it's he's infinite. So uh, space will keep on expanding, keep on expanding. That thing will also come subsequently. That that which is eternally expanding, you beat it into a curve. So when the scientists study, they study the archmason and his process. They cannot know what is beyond. So, <laughs> obeying the eternal's deep command, they have built in the material front of things. This wide world kindergarten of our young souls. Now you see in these two lines, material front of things. Yeah. Uh, and what is this entire material universe? Not, not just speaking of the earth. This entire material universe is a kindergarten, meaning thereby we are still playing with mud of matter. And he makes it one word, yeah. hyphenating world yes. kindergarten. World kindergarten. The whole this is the original school. Yeah. This wide world kindergarten of young souls, where the infant spirit learns through mind and sense to read the letters of the cosmic script. So this is the eternal Veda, the knowledge which is behind everything. That's why if you read, if you really go through the Veda, Vedanta in certain sense, though it helped understand the essence of the Veda, but it also lost something. You know, many people don't know, like if you go to the Vedas, they speak about marriage, they speak about children, they speak about everything. Because the whole creation is included in that. 
that's why you see Shubhendu speaks about secret of the Vedas. He doesn't just you know talk about Vedanta, which later on the mm-hmm. more modern intellectually oriented gurus, because it's conveniently simpler to talk of the essence. But in the Veda, there is a knowledge behind everything. So when we read through Mother's writings, one way to look at it is that well, she has made everything so simple and brought down to a level. But the other part that she has touched everything, every detail and specifics from that eternal standpoint, that it becomes a Veda in its own right. And Sri Aurobindo reveals the secret, secret of the Veda. So she has actually, it is, uh, the whole thing is revealed. <clears throat> so the cosmic spirit, cos- cosmic script and study the body of the cosmic self. So body of the cosmic self is the material universe and search for the secret meaning of the whole. So this is the kindergarten where we have to study the body of the cosmic self, (laughs) not the cosmic spirit. And we have to slowly build the whole which is so vast and appalling. To all that spirit conceives, they give a mold. Persuading nature into visible modes, they lend a finite shape to infinite things. So the spirit conceives. That's the real idea. It's typically like, you know, when a person goes to a... uh, Who comes first? The architect. Uh, And you say, you know, what I want, I want this space to, you know, to be a bit meditative. So this is how you you tell an Mm. architect. She says, okay, fine. So I'll do this way. I'll keep the walls like this. The color will be like this. Now, actually, this is the conception. The space should be meditative. Or the space should be a little more uh, uh, sober. Or the space should be a little more playful. But now that has to be given a visible shape. So that's what they do. They pick up these truths, the idea from within and give it shapes. And what a variety of shapes. And that way when we look at universe, we'll see a very interesting connective, connecting thread. For example, lion. You know, that's whole way to even in uh, with children I have seen. And say a very simple way to introduce them to the uh, to the divine from their everyday experience. So when they go to zoo sometimes and I've interacted and I ask them, okay, you saw the lion. Yes, yes, yes. So what do you think the lion really represents? What does the lion stand for? And they come out with saying that, you know, strength. So all that you need to say is quiet strength. Because, you know, you have to point out that was he restless? No. So there is a strength which is a quiet yeah. power. Or the sea, which is very common experience. Children come, they see the sea. And you ask them, what do you think you feel when you see the sea? So, uh, after a few questions, some child will say vastness. So, it's like, he has, now vastness is the idea behind. Now, how do you create it? So, that's where their role comes in. They pick up vastness of the divine. They pick up infinity of the divine and give multiple, multiple form because there's the only way you can recreate infinity. Where did the Archmasons work from? This is primarily the higher mind. That's where you give concrete form. Primarily. Mm. That's where actually the, the, though the formatures start Mm. earlier, but in in higher mind, there's a tendency to fix everything. And that's why uh, all the religions, this is the birthplace. You know, the moment you say that uh, God is merciful, you have a contact and you have an experience. But the moment you enter the realm of religion, because form is not just a material form. So then you have rules and do's and don'ts and totems Mm. and taboos which get associated with that. Because then this mind will question if God is all merciful, why is there deaths? Why do people die in this creation? Why is there disease and suffering? So we'll see all this. It is the it cannot understand a fathom, but for every mood, it must create something, and that's where the problem comes. Say the divine is all peaceful, but the divine is also the storm. So how do you bring them together? In creation, there is either peace or there is there are volcanoes. <laughs> but actually, if you go deep into the heart of nature, you will see they coexist. If we are not involved in that and when you watch from a surface, you will see that even in the rising of a tsunami, there is a joy which you can capture when you watch it from a distance on National Geographic. 
<laughs> but if we are close to it, then because we are personally involved and we get frightened, so that's where the problem comes. Now, the higher mind, we are in the greater mind here. Yes. Synonymous. Yes. No. The greater mind now, after the higher mind, he will come to the illumined. So there will be a subtler no, race. But I mean, where the arch mason, masons are formulating. Yeah, that's the higher mind. Right. Yes. So. Yes. I forgot. Okay. So, we move further. Persuading nature into visible modes, they lend a finite shape to infinite things. Nature into visible moods. As I said, uh, one day I had a very beautiful, uh, I can't call it experience, but a kind of bhava. Bhava is also a kind of experience. So, uh, walking on the road, the winters had just started and you know it was raining in between. So, suddenly the sky was a mix of uh, clouds which had come up and a little... Uh, Beyond it, one could still see the blue lining of the sky above. So the bhav that came in was, ah, Krishna and Kali are together. Now, you know, uh, it is a nature's visible mood. This is more tangible. So if you really look at everything in nature, it's a mood. How do you experience Kali? By a tsunami. It's mighty. She changes time. Actually, it changes. It changes the life of many. Not only those who were had gone and probably born in different uh, you know portions of time but also those who were left behind their life changed forever we may cry or we may be happy we may say good or bad that's our human judgment but that's not how the gods work so it changes time it changes many things in the entire way a, a group of humanity operates so much of the development we see in Pondicherry including that beach and uh, all that has come up post tsunami. Leave aside the human life, the new habitations, um, different jobs. People had to branch out. Uh, many children who were, you know, uh, taking up traditional works, they uh, discovered or realized that no, they must branch out into other kinds of jobs. So Kali's action is like that. Uh, we may feel very bad about it, but that's because our human sentiment looks things at a in small sections. Each power that leaps from the unmanifest, leaving the largeness of the eternal space, they seized and held by their precision eye and made a figurant in the cosmic dance. So multiple, uh, each god, the, the aspects that we normally see of gods, the images and the pictures, uh, in Indian mythology they are very much preserved, are largely the creation of the higher mind plane. You know, Shiva with a snake around, it's symbolic. So, you know, you have to look at it like, or Vishnu sleeping on the cosmic serpent. So, it's the cosmic uh, serpent which is evolving, it's unfolding. So, as it unfolds itself, the earth goes up and up. It's an evolutionary cycles. And at the heart of it, there is the cosmic being on the uh, ocean of milk, which is knowledge. So, it's a symbolic image. And they create these images. So when uh, seekers or sadhaks enter into this realm, this image in some form flashes before their eyes. Only they don't know there is a yet greater beyond. Vishnu is not confined to this. Original Vedic Vishnu is like a wide eye extended into heaven. That's how Vishnu, if you read the deity in the Vedas. But that is a different altogether. In its free caprice, they bound by rhythmic laws and compelled to accept its posture and its line in the wizardry of an ordered universe. In the wizardry of an ordered universe. So, rhythmic laws. So, you know, we have um, dance forms, for example. And each of these dance forms is inspired with some bhava. So you have the Shiv Tandav, for example. You have even Shiv Tandav Stuti. Actually, if you read the Shiv Tandav Stuti, it's very interesting, the marvel of the poet, that uh, in Ramayana, there is a Stuti which has been done by Ravana for Shiva and another by Rama. And you can make out the difference just by the play of sounds and the rhythm and the meter that this is by <laughs> a gigantic being, another by somebody who has learnt humility and surrender. 
but they are both addressed to Shiva. So uh, for everything they created a rhythm and a meter. But the divine is free and infinite. He is not confined to it. He can intervene in his own way. The, if in the free caprice, yes, they they bound by rhythmic laws. Yes, it's interesting. And they make laws out of it. Yes. The all containing was contained in form. <laughs> so beautiful. Sometimes you have those marvelous lines. I mean, yeah. every line is marvelous. But look at the paradox of this. The all containing was contained in form. Oneness was carved into units measurable. <laughs> The limitless built into a cosmic sum. Unending space was beaten into a curve. Indivisible time into small minutes cut. The infinitesimal masked to keep secure the mystery of the formless cast into form. You see these six lines are really, there is like a contrast that you see <coughs> From this angle, it is everything as a number, rhythm, law, form. Uh, it is trying to conjure something which actually exceeds all of this. The freedom of the infinite. But it puts into shape, number, form. So Indivisible time. Indivisible time. Into small minutes. It's, it's a single flow. <coughs> but we tend to, you know, it's in, uh, there are many analogies like the Ganges. So... In, in Varanasi, you have these uh, different ghats. So, I think there are 80 ghats. That's how the last one is Asi, but I may be mistaken. Uh, it starts from Varuna, so Varanasi. So, there are many ghats. Now, it is believed that at a particular ghat, if you um, release the dead, he it gets liberation. So, I remember uh, as a child going into the river on the boat. It's a very strange sight. It fills you with Vairagya. If you see that hmm. uh, plenty of dead bodies are burning and then you know all this, you have the story. But this used to struck me Ganges is Ganges. How does it matter which ghat? Now I understand ki it was more for a convenience. You can't be having all over all dead bodies burning. So when it was started, it's a convenience that well. And then it was connected to a story of Shiva, uh, you know, showing himself up to Raja Harish Chandra and so on and so forth. But then human mind has fixed it now. So, which is good in a way because it saves the, oh, it keeps the rest of the things clean. But we have a tendency to cut it into bits and pieces, that which is actually free and infinite and indivisible. Invisibly, their craft devised yes. for use. Invincibly, yes. their craft devised for use. The magic of sequent number and science spell, design's miraculous potency was caught, laden with beauty and significance. And by the determining mandate of their gaze, figure and quality equating joined in an inextricable identity. So figure, quality and pattern uh, you know, this whole science of fractals came up yes. and then patterns, the number in, again, you see a side of uh, Indian philosophy where everything, not only zero was known, pi was known and, you know, the distance between sun and earth is known, the distance between moon and sun is known, everything, you, you go through that. Uh, yeah. uh, that's how in, in, in Indian <coughs> Almanac Panchang for thousands of years, they predict when is it going to be an eclipse. It's a prediction to the dot. I saw on uh, YouTube yes. um, a video on Ramanujan's lost notebook. Yes, yes. And one paragraph explained about the black holes. Yes, uh, I'm glad you reminded. Oh. Uh, I think you may be aware of his story. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. He was subtly identified with one of these beings high up there. He used to actually, as a child, his mother also used to worship the deity. I think it was Saraswati. And he would also go to that temple and he yes. started receiving inspirations. So actually much of his mathematics would come as a direct inspiration. And that's why people couldn't understand that how he got it. 
but he got it right yes when he got, got and the he, equation and he said it yeah right. it was right so they couldn't refute it but they never knew how he got it yes and he couldn't live long so you know possibly that energy could not be held for long he fell sick and eventually of course he died but it's amazing that how he was receiving inspiration and um, understanding the universe through number and form on each event they stamped its curves of law and its trust and change of burden circumstance a free and divine incident no more this is the highest truth you go beyond cause and effect if you read swami vivekananda's speech which he gave in chicago mm. he speaks of time space causality and that's how we understand the divine but a time come and he says but brahman is beyond causality all this idea of this happened because of this is still we are moving within the frame and realm of the cosmic divine not yet the transcendent so there are links but the way we link it otherwise very difficult to understand you know how as we know augustine or jagan and maghai how or valmiki ratnakar how they changed yes almost overnight shubindu says whose conversions will scandalize spiritual history so we if we try strictly to see as cause effect and sometimes goes to absurd levels i have seen in india somebody have a heart attack and he is oh worse still somebody had an accident and he is lying in the hospital bed and uh, you know that fellow is very depressed when i went to see him in the evening a colleague and he says that you know friend i want to ask you something i said yes please tell me he says is it really my karma i said why do you ask that he said you know i met with an accident and people are telling me it's your karma i said i one thing i know that is the truck driver's karma for sure who hit you because he was hit by a truck i said your karma or not will start now with what attitude you take it that becomes your karma so that was a big relief because he said one i am hit and on top of it is my fault look at the paradox yeah i am lying in the hospital with my leg hanging up and then too it's my fault and everyone's telling him everyone is telling him that you know he is hit by a truck and you want to take an action against the truck driver because it's your fault ultimately so it can go to absurd levels this cause and effect so uh, law of karma is very different than what we think it to be it's a constant unfolding of the divine if you really look at it through all this mechanism and process and unfolding so a free and divine incident no more at each moment willed or adventure of the soul it lengthened the fate bound mysterious chain a line foreseen of an immutable plan one step more in necessity's long march so whatever the divine has willed that's how ultimately the curve of destiny will unfold <coughs> it doesn't matter it may take place through these set of circumstances through another set of circumstances and always in the cosmic processes you will see a cause but instead of involving ourselves with that we should involve itself with the original will which has set the whole thing into motion and just keep aligning to that so it gives a new way of approaching the whole law of karma unlike the way we now do oh bad karma so you know give some danam do this punyam light some agarbatti and it's not needed i mean in a way it helps the priests you know they have to also educate their children but the point is that it's not needed all that is needed to progressively align oneself and then the whole thing vanishes a term was set for every eager power restraining its will to monopolize the world so this is all happening within the cosmic realm so it it gives a time for every power there is very interesting poem of sri aurobindo on mm, it's on ravana but the story the poem is rakshasa where all these seven sages because these are the sages which must which determine the flow of events so they go and ask krishna because krishna is absolute transcendent they say that when do we call for an end for ravana we are not able to you know decide so krishna says that you know he has to rule for another 1000 years 1000 years 
He says, can't help it. It's an evolutionary necessity. <coughs> so in that poem, you understand that out of the Rakshasa and the animal, Asura has to arise. Now, Asura is a kinetic ego of the mind which dominates over the vital ego. So that difference between the Rakshasa and the Asura. Rakshasa are totally unbridled guys on a rampage. Asuras control their nature by their mind, but extremely egoistic. Asuras may be very religious, very self-controlled, very disciplined outwardly, but extremely harsh, very cold, very much... They may be masters in certain aspects of their nature, but always their eyes ultimately again on aggrandizing the ego self. So he says it's necessary. You can't leap from the Rakshasa to the human, but one day he will fall. So then the scene shifts and he is praying and for each level there is an appropriate god or goddess. So you know, term for every power. So when he prays, who will come out? Rakshasi. Kali comes as Rakshasi. She is the, you know, he worships power. So he tells that, you know, I, I want to be immortal. He says, that's not granted. You have a term. So then he says, okay, in that case, may I fall only to a human who will go surpass me. So it's humanization of the Asuric and the Rakshasic element. So that's why there is a term for every power. Because uh, otherwise it wants to monopolize, but it cannot monopolize. So they do a job of limiting, restraining, containing. And that's how they set the ball of time and space rolling, the cosmic play, which is being explained here in some beautiful verses, lines. A groove of bronze prescribed for force and act and shown to each moment its appointed place forwilled inalterably in the spiral huge time loop fugitive from eternity <laughs> as if it is itself. Uh, I don't know uh, whether I should share or not. Maybe I should share because now the inspiration has come. Somebody was asking once, he said, yeah, I don't know when this world will come. You know, a lot of world coming to end, all this started sometime. Mm -hmm. So, someone said that, you know, according to Quran, the world will end now. It's Qiyamat Kadin, you know, the final judgment day is coming. I said, yes, but for those who believe in Quran. <laughs> so, you must understand, <laughs> it simply means... That the end day is coming for a certain ideological type. So it has to either evolve by transmuting itself. The door is open, maybe through Sufi thought or something, mystic thought. And if you don't evolve, then you have to finish because that's how it is. So <laughs> Huge time loops. So many thousand years, if you really look at it like that. Yeah. The sword of Islam or the, you know. Even Christianity, the way it spread. 2012 was a yes, big one. Yes. Yeah. But it is a time loop, fugitive from eternity. If you connect to the eternal, you survive, no problem. But if you don't connect, if you fix your thought into a fixed formal religion and you say that's it, it's bound, foredoomed to destruction, you don't have to do anything. Yeah. It will collapse below its own weight because time will advance. And the moment the wave of time advances, this becomes redundant and defunct. Yes. This is what people don't understand and you know. And one doesn't have to even worry about it because this is dis determined by powers that thus far and no further. And one can in certain say, sense see all this happening. Inevitable, their thoughts like links of fate imposed on the leap and lightning race of mind and on the frail, fortuitous flux of life, and on the liberty of atomic things, immutable cause and adamant consequence. So it is they <coughs> tie things to... Uh, fate is what? Fate is the... Um, it is the consequence of a seeing will, which takes you through these steps. But we don't know the full plan. So we feel ultimately they have to do what the original will is. So if the original will is that you are, you know, the typical example is of Buddha. So original will is that he will become a conqueror. 
conqueror over the hearts and minds and so the story goes that he his father is told he will either become a great emperor either a great emperor or he will become a sage who renounces the world now look how these forces operate so the father thinks oh my god he will renounce the world no 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 i'll not show him any dark side so he confines mm-hmm. him into a palace where he is provided all the beautiful things and luxuries not realizing he is becoming an instrument to make him renounce because had buddha grown up seeing death and disease <laughs> probably he would have just got used to it <laughs> till 21 he never encountered it so understandably a young man walks out of the palace and suddenly looks at death disease old age which he has never known and it shocks him that life has this side also so how everything becomes a feeder in this great game which looks like chance but behind it there is a greater unfolding many stories like that which reveal this subtle truth idea gave up the plastic infinity so here idea in the highest sense the real idea which can express itself in millions of ways but then each soul chooses a certain curve and says okay so be it and that's what we see here when people came to shorbindo what is the idea transformation but each one made a choice i'll start with the mind then doubts and all this another starts from the heart and for each one a path and curve has been worked out and uh, it has been worked out actually in detail so everyone who takes up this yoga picks up out of infinite possibilities one or the other curve and goes through those experiences which are necessary it has all been done sorted out settled and you have you have to just walk with trust and endurance but and even behind this choice there is the ultimate future that you are going to become but idea itself is plastic transformation can take place in countless ways the moment you put a step you have started fixing its sequence <laughs> of course one can retrace one can all this freedom is always there there is a freedom in each phase of fate idea gave up the plastic infinity to which it was born and now traced out instead small separate steps of chain work in a plot that's it it's like when you are in front of himalayas you want to climb okay climb but you can't climb all over the himalaya <laughs> so you decide okay i'll climb from this part so you will meet the experiences which will come through that you will climb you have to be you have to just move on if you sit down saying oh my god it's very difficult oh, i am doomed i made a mistake that is the only thing which can delay it's a reminder to us also the fact that one has the call and entered the path means one is destined now for the inevitable transformation nothing can stop you except your own as the mother says you sit on the path and say it cannot be done even then you will be pushed because you cannot sit for long mm. but if you keep moving knowing that this is my journey and this may be a very different journey from someone else but i have chosen to go from this angle that is the idea which will keep pushing me and find ways to reach that point immortal ones now tied to birth and end torn from its immediacy of errorless sight so that's where from the supramental it has come down to this level of higher mind where error prone sight knowledge was rebuilt from cells of inference mm. into a fixed body flask and perishable thus bound it grew but could not last and broke and to a new thinking's body left its place this is what happens to scriptures <clears throat> so it picks up various whatever is happening and builds a knowledge system a body which is a rigid body and you'll be surprised with what conviction people hold these beliefs i mean it's not recommended but when you hear some of these priests the way they hold with and for everything they have an explanation and answer and <laughs> which a little common sense and little reason you can see that well it's not really like that and 
because it's it's not really the totality it will there will be in 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 there will there will be gaps things will begin to appear there will be revolt and shubhendra speaks of that in the essays on the gita even revolt against the scripture and the doctrine is justified because there is an incompleteness and imperfection in it i live in an area of southern baptists and i see that every so often the minister is gone and a new one comes yes they they found his faults yes so that's what it, it, there is a new thinking's body and this shift is taking place all over mm. you have to rethink your understanding of you know everywhere you see church it's going through a massive shift you see the recent that's how i look at sabri mala ro you can stick to the past and say that well you know women cannot enter and you can explain it on the basis of a sages tapasya but times have changed so at one point i even put it humorously well the tapasya is over you don't need to <laughs> women can enter it's not going to spoil your it's going to widen your sense of infinity but human mind doesn't and it will be pushed even though strangely it is coming from strange quarters it's coming from quarters which are inimical to <laughs> yes. but yes so but god uses everybody as an instrument at a given point of time he is not bound by who becomes the instrument duryodhana was such a good instrument to bring all the haughty arrogant kshatriyas in one roof because krishna can look at all of them and tell arjun now here is your <laughs> your <laughs> holiday please so that is how times are changing somebody was telling me some time back and people must understand it there was a time this sabri mala is an extreme example there was a time in india when women who were having periods they couldn't enter even a kitchen yes they live aside temple so one lady who came here was telling me said when i was young and you know uh, one day there was work going on and i was in conflict what to do because you know i want to go so i just didn't tell anybody <laughs> and she carried on with everything now look at those times that some people observed so after a month some relatives are asking in joint family what's is your daughter okay <laughs> why see it seems that she is no more having her you know every uh, month yeah right. why because i see every day she is going into the kitchen <laughs> so this lady asked her yeah. that uh, are you okay <clears throat> said yes she said you had your uh, you know every month uh, the um, period she said yes then the mother didn't ask anything she was he was a devotee of shravind and the mother she says one of the things that relieved her was because it was uppermost in her mind when she came here and they asked mother she said these are rules of hygiene have nothing to do with divine of course you can come you can play you can go to samadhi you can come now you see this liberation is required even now probably some remote places are stuck in this idea of course we can make new kind of rigid bodies yes <laughs> let me not yes. speak about them <laughs> a cage i love this word a cage for the infinite's great eyed seraphim thoughts wow <laughs> okay was closed with a criss cross of world laws for bars you cannot go like this you cannot go like that the do's and don'ts <laughs> god cares least <laughs> he looks at that little thing in the heart so all our human laws rules regulations in the end are devices contrivances and they have only a relative practical utility and that's how they should be understood practically speaking but if you make them into absolutes then you are treading a territory where one day or the other god will break this so and hast into a cut horizons arc <laughs> look at the word cut used in this way abrupt sudden harsh cut horizons arc the irised vision of the ineffable a timeless spirit was made the slave of the hours you can't uh, pray to god other than these moments 
slave of the hours. So five times or three times, everywhere it was, or Sundays. <laughs> so you have to ask, why can't every time? Now even children understand. I was asked, interacting with these children, I said, what do you think? When can you pray to God? He said, every time. I said, sure, in the bathroom? He said, yes. I said, very good. But why in the bathroom? He said, God is everywhere. I said, very good. You are liberated people. <laughs> Please go back and teach. <clears throat> Teach the teachers and the parents who may not understand this, that there are no fixed moments, even fixed relationships. You can treat God as a friend. Why do you have to put him on a pedestal with heavy garlands? He must be feeling so suffocated, wanting to run away from his devotees. Because that's the truth, inner truth. But we fix things and thereby finish it. The iron vision of the ineffable. A timeless spirit was made the slave of the hours. The unbound was cast into a prison of birth. <laughs> to make a world that mind could grasp and rule. Otherwise you can't understand. So when Kabir was asked, you are taking Rama's name. Rama, Rama. He, Rama was his mantra, which he received in a strange way. Mm. He was asking always for a mantra and his guru wouldn't give because he is from an outcast. His parentage was not known. So he sleeps on one of the ghats as the story goes. Uh, you know, staircase. These ghats have number of stairs. And early morning, wee hours, not even morning. It's morning only technically. So the guru is going to take a dip in the Ganges. And as he comes down, suddenly he, his feet touches this boy, young lad, who is deliberately lying there. And as it touches, he says, Ram, 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 Ram. <laughs> so he says, thank you. <laughs> I got my mantra. Oh. This is Shakti Path. You touched me and you gave me the mantra. So someone asked him that what, which Rama do you worship? Because we have never seen you go to any Rama temple or this, that. So he says, very beautifully, he says, Ek Ram Dasharath ka beta. One Rama is son of Dasharath. Ek Ram hai Jagat Pasara. Another one is present, imminent in the entire universe. This whole time and space is that Rama. Ek Ram ghat ghat ka vasi, individual, imminent. Ek Ram hai sabse nyara, the transcendent. All of them are one. So that's the liberated being. But otherwise you fix a time for birth and death and for everything. Because the mind cannot handle. So he's saying, because otherwise for the mind, it's impossible. On an earth which looked towards a thousand suns that the created might grow nature's lord and matter's depths be illumined with a soul, they tied to date and norm and finite scope the million mysteried movement of the one. The limited scope. When mother was asked about the law of karma, he said, My child, but who told you that karma is inescapable? The grace can completely annul and cancel karma. This thought is nowhere there in the scriptures. It can mitigate karma that has been heard. So you see, it can completely annul and cancel karma. Who can tie her to cause and effect? <laughs> 